Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome back to my channel. I have a great guest today. I'm really excited to, to be speaking with Chloe Preble. Chloe studied uh, psychology and sociology at the University of Utah, and then she completed a master's degree in uh, information science at the Michigan University or the University of Michigan. And that was when uh, she transitioned into user experience research. And currently, she is working at Axon as a user experience researcher. So welcome, Chloe. Thank you for joining me. Uh, please tell us a little bit about your entry, your introduction, and how you came to UX, UX research. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I love talking about UX anytime. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've, I know that you've been doing these interviews. You, I'm going to guess that you've noticed people come from all different paths to get to UX, and my story is no different. Um, so I, I've just always been really interested in people and how they think and feel and they, how they interact with the world around them. When I was 18, my family and I opened a clothing store here in Utah, and we're designing our own handbags and prototyping them. And while everyone else was really excited about swatches and different materials and colors, I kept finding myself going up to customers and interviewing them about how they were using their handbags, what features were important for their lifestyle, what size was appropriate for them. Had no idea I was doing a user interview, no clue whatsoever. Um, and that's kind of the theme. I kept finding myself doing UX or UX adjacent things throughout my life. Um, and I didn't actually hear about the term until one snowy night in January of 2019, I was sitting on my couch um, and I knew I wanted to go to grad school. This was a couple of years after I'd gotten my bachelor's in psychology and sociology. And I'd been working as an analyst at a university, sorry, Western Governors University. It's a nonprofit that focuses on offering affordable education to adult learners. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd been working there, knew I wanted to go to grad school and was like, what am I gonna do? So I actually came across a magically titled article that said, if you majored in psychology, you might like this. I clicked on it immediately and it was about UX. And I was blown away. I felt so at home in the descriptions that they had, um, you know, talking about really focusing on individuals' needs, uh, learning about how people interact with products, um, how they interact with various aspects of their lives. And so from that moment, I was like, I got to get into this. So the way that I kind of found myself getting there was I ended up getting a work assignment at Western Governors in their UX department, which I didn't know existed until I found out about that article. And so I ended up working with them for about three months on uh, their next generation platform. And I got to learn from some really great talented people. And I knew this is what I wanted. Um, so then I ended up applying to school and getting into University of Michigan. Um, grad school is how I spent my pandemic, um, which was great. So <laughs> I uh, moved out to Michigan with my husband and our cat puppy, mm -hmm. and uh, I went to school. And so while I was there, I learned a lot about UX and research. Um, that was my main focus. And for my thesis, um, and what kind of led me to the position I currently have is I learned about virtual reality. I didn't really know a lot about it before I started my master's program. And as soon as I learned about it in the first term, I was like, this has to be a part of my life somehow. Um, so I ended up focusing my uh, thesis on a simulation that focused on teaching nurses and pharmacists about chemotherapy safety. And so I got to work under Dr. Michelle Aversall. She was my advisor. She was absolutely amazing. Um, really empowered me to run the study and take a lot of ownership over the project, which was wonderful. So I ended up doing uh, usability testing. Um, and then I was able to present my findings to the developers of the app. And it was just such a great experience. And so after that, I was like, how am I going to make this a job? And so I ended up um, networking on LinkedIn with all my heart. And I uh, basically had heard that Axon was doing something with virtual reality training. And I messaged people from Axon like, hey, can we talk about what you're up to? I'd love to learn more. And then anyways, eventually... 
um, my name ended up in uh, the right person's hands. And now I'm a user experience researcher there working on that product. Wow. Wow. Great. What a story. Uh, what a story. Uh, I, what I would like to hear a little bit more about, because now uh, you have exposure to user experience research in this field, and you have a general sense of, I assume, a, a sense of what it is as a general field and mm -hmm. what people do in, in particular places in it. So mm -hmm. I'd like to hear, if, if, uh, if you would, a little bit about the general sense and how you, you would describe your unique position mm -hmm. in this broad field of UX research. What is it that some people are doing that, that you are not doing? So what is distinct about your way of engaging with UX research? Absolutely. So in working with VR, especially thinking back to my master's thesis, something that was very different about uh, my work versus other UX designers was other UX designers were working with 2D and I was working with an entire virtual world. So it really is looking at how individuals interact with a simulated environment. Um, and there are definitely, there's crossover and there's similarity, but there's also a lot of difference um, because again, you're physically embodied and immersed in this place. And so what you're really looking at as a user experience researcher focusing in VR is you're focusing on immersion and presence. What are the factors that go into helping a user feel like they're really there? Um, what factors might cause uh, cyber sickness as it's called? And that's when you're in a simulation and suddenly you feel super nauseous like you've been on six roller coasters so that's an interesting one but there's also that element of looking at how people retain information that they learn in a simulation there's also the element of enjoyment what actually creates an enjoyable experience for people um so kind of taking those ux 2d principles and translating them into a full environment i, I would say that those are kind of some of the main differences mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, when people engage with a, a topic for a long time, they kind of start to see something strange happens. They see uh, almost all of the world or a lot of a large part of life through the lens of that. So recently I spoke with someone who has been doing a lot of research on wrestling, the experience of wrestling, yeah. which has its own, you know, phenomenology or, you know, the, the first person subjective perspective. Mm -hmm. And so we can, once you do that, you just, you might start to describe everything in terms of like wrestling with ideas, wrestling with in a, in a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, did you, uh, ha has that happened in some ways in your thinking about virtual reality? Do you, for example, when you think about reading a book of fiction, do you mm -hmm. kind of transfer some of your thinking in about virtual reality to, it's like, oh, reading a novel is kind of like, you, you, you also get immersed in a, a work of fiction or a conversation does that kind of in your mind transfer as a metaphor uh, in uh, thinking about other uh, topics you know it does at times I, I would say especially with films that are really engrossing and really push you to um enjoy the suspension of disbelief and mm -hmm. you just feel completely engrossed in it i would say that that's a similar experience um but yeah, that's that's a very interesting thing to bring up. I have yet to um, apply VR to every aspect of my life as the uh, wrestling researcher has. <laughs> but I gotta say, I gotta meet them. They sound like a hoot. <laughs> yeah. So um, for people who are, you know, I think they are still, even after the the Facebook, um, I mean, I don't want, I don't know what to call it, fiasco. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> even after these big tech companies. Uh, are showing their lack of you know ability to to retain uh, you you know a lot of a lot of employees but including some ux researchers but i think that the field is still very attractive this it's i think it's genuinely very interesting very stimulating it is it, it, it seems like a very um engaging and fulfilling thing to do to understand to as to to have the profession of understanding what it means for somebody to be on the other end of this you know, whatever the process is, a product or, you know, a handbag to be on the other side of this, uh, this transaction or deal or engagement relationship. Mm -hmm. I think it's very fulfilling. And for that reason, it, it continues to be attractive. So for beginners, do you have a few things like a few principles, some things that they should know about, they should be mindful of? What would you tell them for beginners who want to uh, 
who want to explore the field. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've actually had these sorts of conversations with people who are trying to break into it and um, having the experience myself of breaking into UX, because um, of course, prior to grad school, I was never an official UXer. I just was like, doing all of it though <laughs> mm -hmm. um but you know one of the main things that i definitely like to talk about is um kind of like what it's like to be in industry it's very very different than academia for example so in industry um one i think that it's important to know that ux although it's crucial and i think a lot of companies understand that it is a deeply misunderstood job um mm -hmm. i remember looking at different job postings and i a number of them i came across would be like ux researcher but it would ask for ui design skills interaction design skills and you need to be a software engineer while you're at it mm -hmm. um so you know i think that there is a deep misunderstanding about what ux is and i think there's also an, a misunderstanding about the different branches of ux so for example user experience uh, design is really focusing on designing the actual interactions that somebody is going to have with the product mm -hmm. whereas research really it comes in at the very beginning and it should be there throughout the entire process but that's really understanding your user that's understanding their wants needs pain points frustrations and translating those uh, insights into um, essentially decisions that can be made for the product moving forward so mm -hmm. for example um, somebody might want to you know develop a, a new feature um, to add to an existing product and so where user experience research would come into play is the very beginning, looking at how users actually um, feel about the new feature, how they would interact with it, what their initial thoughts were. The uh, designer would then come in and take those insights and be able to translate those into design. Then um, usually there's a little bit of interplay between the two uh, for user testing. Um, and that that kind of goes on throughout the development of a product. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think if you're looking to break into UX, definitely being clear with yourself on what you're passionate about. I knew I was passionate about research. That's exactly what I wanted to do. And so UX design or UI design as well, not a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. No. Um, so there's that. And then it's also important to remember that even though companies are recognizing how important UX is, there's that misunderstanding of what it is. And so what people will be finding is that you do spend a lot of your time um, evangelizing the process because not everybody understands exactly what goes into being a UX researcher or a designer. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're really spending a fair amount of time educating others about what you do and where your process fits into the product life cycle and where it's highly beneficial for people to have it. Um, it's amazing how much time and money doing initial research will save people um, mm -hmm. as they're developing a product. So those are a couple of things that I would offer. Um, another thing that I would probably also mention for consideration um, is how you plan to educate basically so there's a couple of different routes there's grad school there's boot camps and then there's also you know a number of people who you know they come from totally different backgrounds but their skills are very translatable and so they're able to break into the field because you know they've kind of already been doing this already um, and they can start adding value right away so you know it's important to kind of look at those different factors as well but it is still a growing field. It's incredibly rewarding. Uh, couldn't be happier that I went to grad school during the pandemic and now I'm doing this, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so it, it reminded me when you were describing how it is not always accurately understood. I remembered, you know, in psychology, people who are not familiar with it, they sometimes say, well, so you are studying psychology. Can you read my mind? <laughs> and, you know, we get that as even psychology students hear that from their, you know, friends and family members. So something like that in UX research, maybe the 
the easy bias to have is to, oh, so you're a computer programmer, you develop these, uh, because UX already, that acronym kind of, it's a little bit techy. It's a, uh, like, it, it's connected to the, to the world of software and design. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it has this other side of understanding. It, it, things can be designed and there, there might be an existing product, but still the need for understanding its user is still there and needs to be done as a yeah. separate task. Okay, thank you. Any other misconceptions or misunderstandings of UX research that uh, may be academics? So somebody who uh, might say, uh, I know there are many different sources of misunderstanding, but somebody who has lots of training in research in academia and they are not familiar with industry, are there unique misunderstandings that they, they might have? You already mentioned this event, like the need to justify it uh, from the perspective of the industry. But anything mm -hmm. else that comes to mind on that? Uh... Yeah, no, that's a great question because I do know um, a lot of people from academia are, you know, trying to transition over to UX. Um, one thing that I would probably mention, kind of having experience in both worlds, is that the work that you do in academia is very, very different from the work that you do in industry. So in academia, where you might have, you know, six months to a year to complete one study, um, you got a week. Mm -hmm. You got you got to have turnaround on it. Um, and you'll probably also find that um, the types of studies that you do may be different. You can't um, there's a lot of times that it would be difficult to do a um, randomized trial. Um, sometimes you can do that like with A-B testing, but it's it's definitely a very different experience. Um, and then what you might also notice as being quite different is aside from it being fast paced, when you're writing up your reports and everything, you need to provide, of course, all of your information, but you also need to make it very clear which findings are key for your stakeholders in order for them to make decisions. Um, so yeah. definitely being able to highlight the high level, most important factors. Mm -hmm. um, it, so it is quite different. It's kind of like if you, um, it's going from very kind of slow at your own pace to very fast. And you probably have multiple projects all at once, which I personally really enjoy. I'm never bored, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that is a, that is a main difference. That's so interesting. That's so interesting. It almost, you, I can almost say a different paraphrase what you said in terms of different rhythms. Uh, academia has its own rhythm, very yeah. slow, and the, it has a flattening effect, which is the opposite of what you describe. What you describe is the need to highlight important bits and bring them out. But academic work is to some degree about flattening and bringing all the details and making them at least temporarily equal. All details are equal because you want to pay attention to everything and find out what might be relevant. And maybe other people will decide what, what, what is relevant. But when we have stakeholders or I don't know, managers, who want to an easier, uh, simpler message, not more direct, and you gotta do some some other a different kind of work on the on the message. The message is doing something else. So it's not just the rhythm, but the attitude is different. And I I suspect a lot of people who describe themselves as recovering academics, <laughs> <laughs> that is part of what they are recovering from. That the different in, difference in rhythm and the kind of difference in the way we highlight uh, things. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, thank you. So what I want to ask you, what type of projects you're currently working on and how do you envision the future of your path in as a researcher, as a UX researcher? Would you, for example, consider writing a, a book, an introduction to UX research, or maybe developing your own crash courses or any, any other type of project? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I mentioned, I'm currently working on um, the Axon VR training product, um, which you can always go to their website and see some of the trailers for it. Um, so I'm focusing on that right now and really loving that. Um, so I'm anticipating continuing down that path for a while. Um, what's really intriguing about UX in relation to VR is that or XR technology in general is that it is it's a technology that's both 
old and new at the same time. So for example, um, the first head mounted display was made in 1968. Um, so we've had this kind of tech around for a very long time. And we've also had research on this. There's a lot of great research that's been put out on this in the last 20 years, but we're at a really interesting time where this is kind of the first time that VR has really been commercially available for consumers. And so there's just so much opportunity to be doing user experience research. It's kind of known as the wild west of tech. Um, and what's very interesting about VR as well is, you know, where I think it's particularly impactful is um, they call it dice. So it's situations where they are um, dangerous, you know, they would be too expensive, um, too costly to put together, um, or they would compromise the lesson, um, or they would be impossible to do. There's the eye. Mm -hmm. And so it's really an amazing opportunity to set up education for something like that. For example, there was a great project that was just completed in Brazil a number of months ago where they were able to separate conjoined twins and the way that they prepped for it was they did um, MRI scans of them and were actually able to build full 3D models of them and so surgeons were able to practice on it in VR before they ever did the surgery they were able to make mistakes they were able to figure out oh I should do this next time and it ended up being successful not to say that every outcome with VR training will be successful, but there's just so much opportunity and promise for it. Um, so I think it's a really interesting field for UX, but as I continue on, um, I'm guessing that I will probably go after my doctorate. It is my dream. <laughs> Maybe I'll become a uh, recovering academic at some point. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I see myself going and continuing my research with UX and XR technology. Mm -hmm. I was reminded, I know it's a silly, it's a silly association to have, but I was reminded of that Tom Cruise movie, The Edge of The Edge of Tomorrow, is it called? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's that, that movie that he keeps going over the same situation over and over again. It's it, that's something that is afforded by this. Uh, I mean, something like that, not exactly that, but the ability to fail without the consequence of the real life consequence, which is we often don't have. You, yeah. You shot. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really helpful. So what you're your work has deep societal relevance uh, in how technology is coming into medical services uh, and other areas. So it's it's really applied. It's really applied research. It is not like uh, for the service of some. Um, it's not necessarily in the service of some. I don't know social 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 media technology that wants to just increase the number of clicks. Yeah, it would have more directly beneficial impacts and roles. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. I'm hoping that it'll afford people a lot of opportunities to um, improve in their skill sets. Um, I know that, especially in the medical field, VR is really, really quickly developing. So I'm hoping that that'll have a great impact uh, over there as well. And then, of course, my work at Axon, um, hopefully that will also have a good impact. Um, would you do your uh, doctoral work also on user experience? and VR? Yeah, that's a great yeah. question. Yeah, I've actually thought a lot about it. I would love to study, um, I probably, I would find myself at the intersection of tech and psychology, which I'm already there, but uh, in a more honed way, I would love to study more about how individuals um, interact with information presented in um, a full virtual environment. Um, I'd love to know more about how it affects their behavior. I'd love to know how it affects their views of the world. Yeah, I could go on and on. Mm -hmm. Great. So, uh, Chloe, thank you very much. Uh, any last words that you'd like to share with our uh, few listeners before we say goodbye? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that helped me when I was first getting into UX was honestly reaching out to people and having conversations with them and learning. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I was a feverish networker on LinkedIn and I was able to talk to a, a lot of wonderful people. I think that I, I found that the UX community is very, very helpful and, and people are passionate about what they do and they're passionate about helping others. So, you know, reach out to people, make those connections um, and just kind of start exploring different elements of UX and seeing where your passions lie. 
something that I think makes the UX community uh, extra compassionate and welcoming is that it consists of lots of individuals who have transitioned, who have experienced having an attachment to one field and then detaching and then getting into, so they have this experience of moving and they know that it is difficult. It can be difficult to do that. And it, it, it's wonderful to have the help or guidance or some tips from helpful other people. So they, uh, yeah, I, I really have had also lots of good experience with, with the community. Thank you very much, Chloe. Let me uh, stop, stop the recording and then we will say our private goodbye. Great, thanks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.